Good evening and welcome to Behind the Headlines and in this programme we'll be discussing the 35th anniversary of the biggest terrorist attack to occur in Britain and that was the Lockerbie Air Disaster. So back on Wednesday the 21st of November 1988, US flight Pan Am 103 took off from London to New York with 257 passengers trying to get home for Christmas when disaster struck. The Boeing 747 plane exploded in Medea as a bomb went off over the Scottish town of Lockerbie. All passengers and crew died that day, uh, including uh, 11 people on the ground in Lockerbie. And this was the worst terrorist attack to happen in Britain. And we'd be asking, have the lessons of Lockerbie been learnt? Was Libya responsible for this terrorist attack or were the Iranians behind it? Um, Reagan, I, I, I know that you weren't alive when this happened on the 21st of December uh, 1988. It's very fresh in my mind because as a, a 15 year old I was doing a paper round and of course this was the story that was dominating the news headlines at the time. It was all over the front pages mm -hmm. and all of them had that picture of just what was left of the Pan Am Flight 103 which was the head uh, literally the cockpit of that plane on a kind of hilltop outside the sleepy Scottish town of uh, Lockerbie uh, and that this has been the biggest terrorist attack against Americans since 9-11. So prior to 9-11 this was America's biggest terrorist attack. Well it was indeed that photo of what was essentially the front of the plane on the hill there in Lockerbie that was my first exposure to it. Throughout the 90s and um, in, into the early um, Nauties, as they've become known as, there were a series of documentaries and programs that would crop up every now on American uh, television channels explaining a little bit about it, generally linking the bombing to Libya, tying it in with Muammar Gaddafi and his uh, dictatorship. Uh, but there was always, at the same time, a fair amount of skepticism and doubt as to what actually happened. It was really it's been shrouded in mystery to some degree and there are conflicting reports, conflicting theories uh, from people who are in almost every case, regardless of what take they're having, uh, coming from a place of authority and even assumed reliability. So it, it's a fascinating topic and it's right that I know years on we can forget these things. We, we are already seeing some of the terror attacks. We've spoken before about 7-7. Hardly anything is mentioned about 7-7 anymore. Um, but it, it's so important that we remember and that we learn lessons and that we also we also ask the questions now that maybe haven't been asked previously and analyze the data as it's developed since. Absolutely, but I mean, when we actually look at what happened uh, during that fateful day on Wednesday, the 21st of December, 1988, and for those passengers, many of them, vast majority of them were Americans, mm -hmm. Uh, wanting to go home for Christmas, flying into New York City, uh, looking forward to Christmas. I mean, this is essentially everyone's worst fear of actually flying on an aircraft and then finding that someone's put a bomb on board the plane and blows the plane up. But also, I mean, you've got to think not only of the passengers and the family of those uh, of their loved ones that never came home that day, but also the sleepy Scottish town of Lockerbie, where, the, mm. where this Boeing 747 won exploded over midair. The fact that it destroyed 21 houses, killed 11 people on the homes, uh, 11 people in their homes at 7 p.m. in the evening, uh, was all dark as the t Scottish town was getting ready for, for Christmas. Uh, we can see there on screen the devastation, the crater caused by the um, destruction of mm. this uh, Boeing 747 flight, Pan Am 103. Um, but also the fact that the deep psychological impact that this has had on the residents of uh, of Lockerbie uh, and those who woke up to find dead bodies in their garden, uh, people's luggages uh, over their garden full of dead bodies. I mean, that must be extremely difficult for that town up in Scotland, Lockerbie, to actually come to terms with the devastation and the evil that befell them on the evening of the 21st of December 1988. 
Well, there would have been quite a spread in regard to debris if you're thinking of altitude, um, the volume of the blast, velocity, um, the force of gravity and how it, it drags and levels everything. Uh, the force of the blast was so powerful that the plane broke into thousands of pieces and it, it makes it even more, you, you see the severity of it when we see that picture of that crater um, and it's there, you, the crater, uh, how massive it was, considering this massive explosion had happened, tells you somewhat of the scale of it. And the falling wreckage destroyed 21 houses, killing an additional 11 people, as you said. Remains the worst terror attack to have occurred in British history, uh, even beyond 7-7 uh, that we've spoken of. But we have to ask, the question, the question now, especially that is an interesting one that you've raised given our current geopolitical climate, but I think a necessary one is, was it really Libya? Was um, Colonel Gaddafi truly responsible uh, for this attack in a direct way? Maybe there was some involvement, but were others involved in a deeper sense? Well, there seems to be uh, coming out now um, uh, a lot of former intelligence operatives, and we'll go through this later in the program, who are really indicating that the Iranian regime was behind Lockerbie. Um, also, uh, Palestinian involvement with the Palestinian Front for the Liberation of Palestine bomb maker, um, who actually planted that um, scentless Semtex into that radio cassette player, as uh, we, we had in the, uh, the 1980s, and that was in uh, luggage. And of course, we can see it on the screen there where the Semtex had no smell, so it was very difficult to, almost impossible to detect. At the time, I don't think there were x-ray machines before you put luggage through for getting onto a plane. Um, and of course, that was put on board Pam Am Flight 103 that exploded over Lockerbie. Now, according to uh, Britannia, US Flight Pam 103 operated by Pan American World uh, Airways. Pam Am for short, um, is no longer existent. So it, it uh, exploded over the Scottish town of Lockerbie on December the 21st, 1988, after a bomb on board was detonated. All 259 passengers and crew on board died that day, including 11 people on the ground. And according to a BBC uh, uh, article entitled Lockerbie Bombing, the ultimate detective story, uh, they say that uh, everyone on board the Pam Am Flight 103 uh, that night was killed. 259 passengers and crew, the oldest was 82, and the youngest was a two-month-old baby. Two-thirds of the victims were Americans, and it was considered the worst terrorist attack on the US until 9-11. Another 11 people perished when the wreckage fell on the homes in Lockerbie. In total, 44 UK citizens were murdered, and it remains the worst act of mass murder in British legal history. Uh, the flight, uh, Pan Am Flight 103, taking off from London to New York City just days before Christmas. Around 7 p.m., the Boeing 747 reached a height of approximately 31,000 feet, preparing to fly over the Atlantic. And at this point is when a timer activated the bomb and it exploded on board. Um, it was made from odorless plastic explosive known as Simtex. You mentioned that it was hidden inside that cassette player already pictured and stored in a suitcase, uh, causing the aircraft to break into thousands of pieces upon uh, detonation and landing in an area covering, get this, 850 square miles. Uh, just quite quite a spread, even though the 259 passengers and crew on that doomed flight came from 21 countries, most were Americans, and this increased the threat of terrorism in the U.S. And we can see with that plane there all the fragmentations of the Pan Am Flight 103, the uh, Boeing 747, where all... Uh, uh, literally exploded uh, in midair over Lockerbie. 319 tons of wreckage um, over 845 square miles makes it the largest crime scene in history. A town that would normally have four police officers on duty found itself at the center of this massive recovery operation and investigation. 
And by the morning of the 22nd of December, about 1,100 police officers were involved, along with 1,000 personnel from the military, emergency services, local authorities, and voluntary groups. In the weeks that followed, a painstaking search recovered wreckage as far away as the coast of Northumberland, on the other side of the country. Uh, investigators found signs of an explosion on one of the baggage containers from the forward hold. Uh, Scottish police and FBI agents established the bomb had been concealed in a Toshiba radio cassette player in a Samsonite suitcase. And uh, all the uh, hallmarks were blamed on Libya uh, for this state terrorist attack that occurred on the 21st of December 1988. It says um, that investigators of Pam and Flight 103 uh, believe that two of the agents of the Libyan intelligence were responsible for the bombing. It was widely speculated at the time that the attack had been in retaliation for the 1986 US bombing of Libya's capital, Tripoli. Uh, ten days before a bomb exploded in a nightclub in West Berlin, visited by US military personnel that murdered two people and injured more than other 200 US military personnel. And this occurred before the American attack uh, that President Ronald Reagan issued in 1986. The Libyan leader at the time, Muammar Gaddafi, refused to turn over the two suspects. And as a result, as a direct result of that action, both the US and UN Security Council imposed economic sanctions against Libya, which were longstanding. Uh, the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie uh, remains the worst act of terrorism ever carried out on or over uh, British soil, more than 30 years after the downing of it with the loss of everyone on board. Only one man has ever been convicted in the case, a Libyan intelligence agent named Abdel Basset Amagrahi, who was jailed for life on 270 counts of murder by a Scottish court in 2001 he was released in 2009 because he had terminal cancer and died in 2012. The court found that McGrahi purchased clothing in Malta that was packed into the Samsonite suitcase in which the bomb, a barometric pressure device built into a Toshiba radio cassette recorder, was hidden. And he placed the suitcase then on a flight from Malta to Frankfurt from where it was transferred to London's Heathrow. At Heathrow, the suitcase was transferred again to the New York-bound Pan Am flight, and the explosives then detonated a little more than half an hour after takeoff. His alleged Libyan co-conspirator, Lamin Fima, was acquitted in the 2001 trial. Nobody has been convicted for making the deadly device. And then we see that in 1998, uh, Gaddafi... Uh uh, finally accepted uh, a proposal to extradite the men in 2001 after an investigation that involved interviewing 50, 15,000 people and examining over 180,000 pieces of evidence. Al Bisset, Al Bisset uh, Mad Graki, uh, was convicted of the bombing and sentenced to 20 years, later 27 years in prison. The other man, Lamin uh, Halafi uh, Fimel, uh, was acquitted. Uh, the Libyan government uh, eventually agreed to pay damages to the families of the victims of the attack. And in 2009, Magrahi, um, who had been diagnosed with terminal cancer, was released from prison in Scotland on compassionate grounds and allowed to return to Libya. The United States strongly disagreed with the Scottish government's decision. And then shortly after this, if you remember, uh, it was um, our prime minister at the time, Tony Blair, having a meeting with Colonel Gaddafi in a kind of tent and uh, to see if they could uh, forge closer political and economic ties. And out of that came the release of Magrahi. It's very interesting to remember that scenario, uh, extremely unpopular with the US government. Uh, there's generally a, a policy of if someone has committed uh, such an act as heinous as uh, Magrahi was found guilty of, they will be executed or have life imprisonment. Of course, we, we don't even have execution now. I don't even think for, for treason anymore, um, which this was a clear act, not just against the United States, but against the United Kingdom. And 
Uh, and so the idea of his being only convicted in uh, you know the early 2000s and then released in 2000 Eight years later and, and nine it, it, it's just bizarre Simon I know people who've um, been in for that length of time for grievous bodily harm not the murder of 200 and um, what, what, what is it 259 people. people on board and 11 more on the ground you know so uh, the justice system is strange uh, in, in that way but there's a few things that are conflicting and that are going through my mind, that have gone through my mind as we've been considering this. Uh, the Libyan government eventually agreeing to pay damages to the families of victims of the attack. There are initial reluctance to hand over for extradition the suspects. The amount of uh, hours, 15,000 people interviewed, just in, an incredibly immense body of work. So it's no surprise that it's taken so long. It's no surprise that we're still discussing it. It shouldn't be a surprise that, as we'll see, there's still legal action going on in, in regard to this. So uh, in, in July 2010, we had an investigation that was spurred by U.S. Senators revealing that oil company BP had lobbied for a prisoner transfer agreement between the United States, uh, the United Kingdom rather, and Libya. Although both uh, BP and the UK government denied that Megrahi was discussed specifically, in 2009, British, Secre uh, British Justice Minister Jack Straw had stated that BP's business dealings with the Libyan government was a factor in considering his case. No, but it was also interesting as well. I think we have to put this in kind of the context of what happened after 9-11. Um, and it was 9-11 uh, that really brought uh, Colonel Gaddafi out of the cold um, because then he realised he wanted to be on the American side. He didn't want to be one of those nations targeted on George Bush's war on terror. And also then we saw after the uh, war in Iraq in 2003 um, that uh, Colonel Gaddafi came clean with his nuclear weapon program mm. and handed that over to the United States because what he felt was that the Americans would go after him because he was considered an enemy of the United States, particularly during the Reagan administration during the 1980s. And is exactly what happened with Pan Am Flight um, you know, 103. Um, now, the Scottish court uh, blamed the Lockerbie bombing on uh, the state sponsorship um, of terrorism by Libya. So we see here that in 2001, the Scottish court sitting in a neutral Netherlands ruled that it was an act of state-sponsored terrorism uh, carried out by the Libyan intelligence services. Three judges decided that al Magahi was part of the plot and convicted him of playing a central role in the bombing. He became known as uh, the Lockerbie Bomber, uh, but uh, he has always uh, um, been accused of acting along with other Libyan conspirators, including uh, Masoud, the man now facing trial in the United States. The case was put before the court that uh, 20 years ago followed an international investigation that extended to 70 different countries uh, for the uh, Lockerbie bombing. Uh, we also see that almost every piece of key evidence has been debated and disputed to the aspiration of the Scots and the Americans who actually investigated uh, the Lockerbie disaster when it happened in 1988, are responding to accusations that Libya and Magari were framed. A former chief constable of Dunfries and Galloway Constabulary says, once declared, you couldn't make this up. How on earth can you set up a chain of evidence like that? It's nonsense. Well, I'm not certain if it is nonsense, uh, given the way that we see governments can act and do act, and even uh, whether or not Li Libya, because of course they paid damages, would they have been willing to receive payoffs from other groups, from uh, the groups actually behind it to be the scapegoat, essentially. Um, this is all up for consideration, but initially, it's important to note, initially, Suspicion fell on Iran and Syrian-backed uh, Palest and a Syrian-backed Palestinian militant group. That was the initial suspicion. So li li Libya came after. Um, uh, on 3rd of July 1988, a U.S. Navy cruiser, USS Vincennes, uh, mistakenly shot down an Iranian airliner over the Gulf, tragically killing all 290 mil uh, men, women, and children on board. Ar Iran swore revenge. Three months before 
the Lockerbie bombing in an operation titled Autumn Leaves, West German police had raided flats in Frankfurt and arrested members of the Syrian-backed Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine General Command, that's the PFLPGC. The group had been preparing bombs in radio cassette players. So this, you, you see it's fit, fitting together here. By December 1988, most of these uh, who were under investigation and had uh, been arrested at that point had been released. The feeder flight for Pan Am 103, Pan Am 103A, had left, where from? We already said it, from Frankfurt. Uh, months were spent investigating the PFLPGC group, but the search for evidence then took the inquiry into a different direction, to an island in the Mediterranean. Uh, which was Malta, but uh, before we go and discuss the pos prospect of Iranian involvement in the Lockerbie bombing uh, that occurred uh, 35 years ago, let's have a look at this excellent report produced by our friends at CBN. In other news tonight, the man accused of one of the deadliest terror attacks against Americans appeared for the first time in U.S. federal court today. Abu Ajila Massoud is charged with building the bomb that downed Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland in 1988. All 259 people on board were killed, including 190 Americans. 11 people on the ground also died. The suspect worked as a Libyan intelligence officer under former President Muammar Gaddafi. In 2012, he reportedly admitted to Libyan authorities that he made the bomb that took down the plane. And for more on this, we're joined by Bill Rog uh, Roggio, senior fellow and editor of the Long War Journal at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Bill, welcome. Good to have you on this evening. Uh, so this man's first court appearance today, some 34 years in the making. How significant is this? Hello, Jen, and thanks for having me on. Yes, this is significant. I mean, we have to understand this is 34 years since the attack and the investigation is still ongoing. There's been one person who was tried and convicted of the attack. He was given 27 years uh, in a Scottish court. Um, he was let uh, freed after about, I want to say it was 12, 11 or 12 years because of uh, uh, he had prostate cancer and he died shortly afterwards. And yet there has been no one else who's been convicted. It, it is significant. The U.S. still and Scottish officials still believe they're, they always believe that this was a plot. It wasn't just a, a one-off attack by an individual or a small group of people, but that this was a plot by the Libyan government. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi ultimately admitted that the government did this. But the fact is, is that no one's really paid a price for this than other than one individual. So, but there are gonna be questions going forward during this trial of how the information, how he, uh, this, this confession was extracted. So that, that, should, that really yeah. does bear watching in this case. Yeah. Uh, so Masood is the third suspect in this decades-long case, the U.S. announcing charges against him just two years ago. How did investigators finally track him down? Yeah, he was in custody in, um, uh, as you noted, a decade ago. He apparently made some uh, type of confession. This is where it's really, we're going to see how this information comes out via the trial. And this is where his lawyers are really going to go strong and say, very likely say the information was obtained under, um, he was coerced to make a confession. Uh, it's been reported that he was in, detained by a militia group several years ago, uh, that, and that information filtered up to the U.S. government. That's when this charge came out two years ago, and then ultimately he was transferred into cu U.S. custody, uh, obviously this week, and, and now the trial is gonna begin. But I think the real key is how was that a, a confession obtained? Uh, this is going to be the real sticking point in this trial. Obviously, U.S. officials believe they have enough information. Perhaps there, were, perhaps the uh, um, the individual, uh, you know, who um, whose name was McGrary, who was convicted and, and sentenced, maybe he did give up information that hasn't been revealed to the U.S. government. This is what we're going to find out during the uh, the trial stage that should be coming up in, within the next year or two. Yeah, it'll be fascinating to watch, that's for sure. Uh, there are calls in the international community for the United Nations to choose the Lockerbie bomb trial court outside of the U.S. or Scotland. What do you make of that push, Bill? Yeah, I think that's a, a grave mistake. The U.S. courts are well-established. They have the expertise and the knowledge and the, uh, the system, the, the democratic system, the judicial system that is 
uh, ideal for handling a case like this. If he's going to get a fair trial, he's certainly going to get a fair trial in the United States. And, you know, look, I just wouldn't trust an inter international court to to deal with this this type of case. With who's going to select the judges for an international court? What international court exists that would that would try this? Would this be the, uh, you know, these are the questions. So let's keep it in the United States. Let's go with a system that works rather than some ad hoc system that very likely won't achieve justice, whether he's guilty or innocent. All right, Bill Raggio with FDD, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. And that's uh, thanks to our friends at CBN. Uh, that news item was from December 2022, so last year. Um, but I think it's important that we mark the 35th anniversary of the worst terrorist attack to occur on British school. That was in uh, Scotland um, with, uh, with the attack uh, on Flight 103 over Lockerbie. Now, what's interesting, uh, Reagan, is the fact that here we have growing evidence of Iranian involvement. Mm. And uh, this comes uh, from a former CIA operator called uh, John Holt, who published an article um, in the Times of Israel. Uh, says, as of, uh, I'm a former CIA agent. Iran was behind Lockerbie and should be made to pay. Uh, and he says here as well that, um, as we see under the screen, despite former US AG bar claims, Libya did not carry out the horrific 1988 bombing of a plane over Scotland. The US should bring Iran to justice now. And just to give the credentials of John Holt, uh, this is according to his biography, um, his intelligence credentials are that he is a professor of political science at a US university. He has served more than 40 years in the US intelligence community, including 25 years as a CIA operations officer in the Middle East. He was uh, a, a long-time handler of Abdul Majid um, Gayaka, who was, who was the key US government witness in the Lockerbie trial conducted at The Hague in, uh, in 2000. And, and this is what he said, as a former CIA operations officer, I am breaking 20 years of silence about one of the most heinous plane bombings on record, Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, on December 21st, 1988. I can now tell you, as I've been telling the CIA and FBI since being interviewed by them in early 2000, that I and many other intelligence officers do not believe that Libya is responsible for the bombing. Iran, as the original evidence clearly showed, is the true perpetrator of this deadly attack and should be brought to justice. Two weeks ago, just before stepping down as U.S. Attorney General, William Barr, who was also AG in 1992 and oversaw the investigation and indictment of the case, announced new charges against a Libyan man known as Massoud for supposedly constructing the bomb that detonated on the plane. I believe Barr and the Justice Department announced this new indictment purely for the purpose of shoring up Barr's original faulty 1991 indictments. The evidence and logic in the current case against Mr. Massoud are flimsy, as flimsy as the cases were two decades ago when Barr steered focus away from the obvious culprit, Iran. I know Libya is not behind the bombing because I was the longtime handler for the principal U.S. government witness, Abdelmajid Giaka, a Libyan agent who never provided any evidence pointing to Libya or any indication of knowing anything about that nation's involvement in the two years after the bombing. Yet years later, he testified against the convicted Libyan intelligence officer Abdel Basset al Magrahi at the Lockerbie bombing Pan Am 103 trial conducted at The Hague in 2000. Extraordinary. Now, it's interesting, Simon, that this trial that's, that's ongoing, that's meant to be ongoing, they continue to put it back. So we saw the report just now uh, in, indicating this Massoud is going to go on, on trial. It's been delayed four times. It's currently now um, been delayed yet yeah, again. It was supposed to be in October um, um, of this year. That was another delay. Now it's been delayed to this month, um, and we'll see. It's, it's probably going to be delayed again into um, the, the new year, which um, is, is very interesting, but it doesn't exactly inspire confidence 
in um, the availability of evidence against this individual, which there must be in order for a fair conviction. No, absolutely. And, and, and the fact that we see, for example, with John Holt, uh, a former CIA operative working 40 years probably with the CIA and other security um, forces out in the Middle East, um, would be would have access to classified information. He would have access to what the intelligence community are saying. And there's too much circumstantial evidence that points to the Iranian regime rather than to Libya. Um, and I know that, uh, so for example, the big question is, why the cover-up? Um, and I think this has more to do with the fact that the Americans, um, ever since the Atollah Khomeini and the Islamic Revolution occurred in 1979, have never wanted to confront this regime. And this regime has been at the forefront of every anti-Israel, anti-American, every anti-Western acts of terrorism over that period of time uh, without never being responsible. And the Iranian regime, can be seen as the head of the snake. And of course, we've done many programs on October the 7th on Hamas, but who controls Hamas? It's the Iranian regime. They're the ones that supply with weapons and training, as well as Hezbollah, as well as Palestinian Islamic Jihad, as well as the Houthis in, in Yemen, as well as propping up Assad's regime in Syria, and also then fired uh, rockets and missiles into Saudi Arabia, destroying their uh, kind of oil refinery a few years ago. So we see that the Iranian hands of this regime uh, are full of blood, innocent blood. And, you know, there is a big question marks as to why the international community are not really looking into this and the evidence of this to give justice, not only to the families of those who were murdered on Pan Am Flight 103 35 years ago, um, but also for the residents of Lockerbie, because I'm sure that those people in the town of Lockerbie uh, who were alive when the plane exploded over their town, um, are still haunted and terrified um, from that day after seeing the devastation of the destruction of that transatlantic flight from Heathrow to uh, New York City 35 years ago. But it's fascinating how things shifted. The attention initially and the evidence was fully on Iran and fully on this Palestinian terror group. All of the evidence is, is there in, in terms of the uh, e even the stylistic elements of the uh, planting of the bombs in these cassette um, tapes. That, that, that's all in part for the link between Frankfurt, Malta and, and London. All of that is in sync. It, it's, it seems very clear cut in one way. Um, but the attention has shifted and was focused away. And I, I think it does seem that there's some sort, form of unofficial policy of appeasement when it comes to uh, Iran. Here we have uh, the testimony from uh, th this former intelligence operative saying it's that the, yeah, the, the, the U.S. government prevented my testimony and hid from evidence the cables I wrote that proved Giaka knew nothing. Uh, the individual whose uh, handler he, he served as, when my cables were finally released to the trial, at the demand of the defense, the court dismissed Giaka along with the two CIA operations officers sent to the trial to testify to his credibility. It's, it looks like it's a setup. Um, Masood had no history or signature for making the type of bomb that brought down Pan Am 103 nor for concealing the bombs in the Toshiba radios. While as the PFLPGC, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command, did. So we've already indicated. And also we have to see um, that McGrawy was uh, convicted on one major piece of evidence, and that was his suitcase. They found some clothing that, uh, that was in that suitcase that they believed it belonged to him, and they found the manufacturer of this clothing was a store in Malta. So they visited the store, and the shopkeeper was shown a number of different pictures, and he said he thought that the person who bought that clothing, because it only paid a lot of money for that clothing, which is why it stood out, um, was the person, he thought it was Magrahi, the, uh, uh, the Libyan uh, intelligence operative. So even he wasn't 100% sure of who it was. And so therefore, this is why, uh, you know, Magrahi got blamed for it. Now, the big question is, 
this could have been a number of different actors involved in this. This, this could have been Libya involved together yeah. with the Palestinian Front for Liberation of Palestine that was currently based in Damascus that had that protection from uh, President Assad's regime in Syria, uh, uh, yeah, Bashar al-Assad's father. Uh, Faisal Assad, and then of course we see then also the kind of Iranian involvement, and this fl this follows through with the Iranians and how they conduct a lot of their terrorist activities, which they will recruit Sunnis, who they're completely uh, theological odds with, uh, to give them finance and training and equipment to carry out attacks. So it's possible that, uh, for example, the Iranians were the masterminds behind this, but they used Palestinian operatives, but also possibly Libyans as well, yeah. um, in this terrorist attack. There's no reason why Megrahi could should be excused completely from this because of some of that evidence that's already been presented that you just mentioned. Um, but that shouldn't exclude the investigation of other likely parties. This wasn't just a one-man job. It wasn't just uh, likely a one-nation job. You also have to consider motive as well. And the, the, the motive, you can, you can find some motive in uh, relation to Libya, uh, especially when you consider its alliances and you consider the general geopolitical frame of that time, um, the attitudes towards Gaddafi and, and whatnot as well. But it doesn't ring out confidently as a link up between Megrahi, the Palestinian terror group, and, uh, and Iran. And when you bring all of those together, it begins to make a bit more sense, especially given Iran's pledge. This is basically, it comes across as a tit for tat type. Um, uh, they, they are revenging a massive mistake, an accidental uh, bringing down of a commercial uh, flight uh, from Iran. Uh, very similar death toll, a very s similar type um, tra tragedy in regard to the loss of life of men, women, and, and children. It, it just rings out very, very clearly. The difference is one was a mistake for which there was apology. The other is uh, deliberate. Absolutely. So going back to John Holt's uh, article in the Times of Israel, he says that we just observed the 32nd anniversary, because the article was written two years ago, uh, three years ago. Um, we're now at the 35th anniversary uh, of the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. They said it's time to drop the routine CIA procedure of embellishing intelligence reporting to fit a preconceived outcome rather than follow the facts. The families of Pan Am Flight 103 and victims have suffered long enough and deserve now to be able to rest assured that the real perpetrators of this act of terrorism, the Iranian actors, are brought to justice. He says, if Libya is truly the culprit, why did the US not indicate Libyan intelligence chief uh, Sansuri, who has reportedly been sitting in a Libyan jail since the nation's revolution back in 2011? And, it w and, he, and would have been in charge of any such high-profile high operation at the time of the bombings. And why was credible evidence pointing towards Iran ignored, uh, given Iran's clear motive for the attack as retaliation for the downing of a, a civilian Iranian Airbus as its proven capacity to carry out attacks similar to the bombings over Lockerbie. Uh, he says that he has served more than 40 years in the Middle East and saw numbers of Americans killed by terrorist attacks, all orchestrated and supported by the mullahs in Iran. And he says, I urge uh, then US President Trump to bring Iranian religious leadership for justice for the Pan Am 103 bombing now. And the US and Israel should work together to strike key Iranian military facilities, the IRGC training camps, and all nuclear development sites, both open and secret, before Iran gathers enough strength to strike again, which they will. So let's have a look at uh, this uh, excellent uh, CBN news report, uh, how the Iranian regime is vowing for the destruction of the United States, known as the Big Satan, and of course Israel is known as the Little Satan to this Iranian regime. With U.S. troops in nearby Afghanistan, Syria and Iraq, the head of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, also known as IRGC, warned U.S. troops could now be potential targets. 
The Treasury Department already had more than 970 Iranian individuals and entities on its sanctions list. But this is the first time America has labeled another nation's military a terrorist group. We're doing it because the Iranian regime's use of terrorism as a tool of statecraft makes it fundamentally different from any other government. The administration says it's singling out the IRGC because of the paramilitary's primary role in the regime's global terrorist campaign. The IRGC masquerades as a legitimate military organization, but none of us should be fooled. It regularly violates the laws of armed conflict. It plans, organizes, and executes terror campaigns all around the world. Randy Singer's Virginia law firm handles several cases on behalf of Iran terror victims. Our clients have been uh, taken hostage in Yemen by the Houthi rebels who were funded by the IRGC. Our clients have been taken hostage in Iraq by Shia militias funded by the IRGC. Our clients have been subject of suicide bombing attacks funded by the IRGC. So this means a lot to our clients, both in their court cases, but also more importantly to people that will be like our clients that might be subject to terrorist attacks in the future. With hundreds of thousands of members, the Revolutionary Guard oversees the country's ballistic missiles and nuclear programs, as well as having its hand in lucrative businesses, including Iran's banking, shipping and oil industries. The leaders of Iran are racketeers, not revolutionaries. The Iranian people deserve better than to be governed by this cadre of hypocritical and corrupt officials. Singer says targeting the group will hopefully deprive the world's leading state sponsor of terror the financial means to spread its reign of evil. This is trying to dry up the money source for the IRGC. They spend about a billion to two billion dollars a year funding terrorism. And the idea is now we're putting on notice companies that deal with them, that if you deal with them, you're bankrolling terrorism as well. <laughs> Well, it's a, a fascinating discussion and a, a dimension that we really do need to consider that um, all too often has, hasn't been considered. Um, was Palestine, were Palestinian terrorists responsible in some way um, for this attack? Um, I found that this is fascinating, uh, Simon. Um, uh, an article published in The Guardian in 2001 which points the finger very, very clearly. Uh, I, I was not living in the UK in 2001, but I'm not entirely convinced such an article would appear in The Guardian today. It speaks of the Byzantine world of Palestinian, Palestinian para, paramilitary politics. Uh, few players are as obscure or as ruthless as Ahmed Jabril, leader of what was at the time the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command. And it goes on to uh, point the finger very fully at this Jabril and um, this Palestinian group, um, indicating even his open denial of any involvement only days after. Um, seemingly uninvited um, d d denial. There was investigation going on at the time. And it's interesting, it's like stepping into a time capsule because um, at this point in time, this article uh, from 2001 is saying the West has been keen for years to woo Damascus, now essentially in ruins um, by uh, Assad, and Tehran, uh, which has been appeased year in and year out. Uh, and continues to be done so. They want to isolate Saddam Hussein of Iraq, who's seen as the most destabilizing influence in the region. And so blaming Jabril's outfit would draw attention to his close dependency on the Damascus regime. But then it begins to ask questions, and it's those same questions that um, you've outlined um, for us in re regard to this situation. And I think we have to take a step back. I mean, yeah. we, we, we're discussing events that occurred 35 years ago. Yes. It was still the Cold War, even though we started to see that uh, freeze of relations between the United States under President Reagan and Gorbachev. Uh, in uh, This was a, uh, a months before the fall of the uh, Berlin War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, but also in that context as well, we also have to understand Palestinian terrorism as it was carried out by Arafat and the PLO, Black September and other uh, Palestinian terrorist organizations that they carried out, uh, you know, kidnappings, uh, the um, hijacking of aircraft, as we saw that with Entebbe in 1977, mm. with the Entebbe raid. This, is, this was uh, the PLO's main source of income, was terrorism. 
kidnapping and committing acts of terrorism and hijacking aircraft. Um, and, and this is why when it comes, when you're identifying any particular group of people, this is where the expertise lied. And the fact is that the Popular Front for the, for the Liberation of Palestine were actually located in Damascus, so they had Iranian and Syrian protection to carry out those sort of attacks. So according to David Horowitz, um, who's the editor of the Times of Israel Online, a, a fantastic news publication, uh, wrote an article uh, in which he says this, who made the bomb? The full truth about Lockerbie is still not being told as relatives of one man convicted for blowing up Pan Am Flight 103 try to post humorously clear him potentially crucial evidence of a Palestinian terrorist role is again withheld. So he says here, for example, uh, in this, that the bombing of uh, Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland on December the 21st, 1988, remains the worst act of terrorism ever carried out in Britain. Uh, more than 30 years after the downing of the, uh, of the Boeing 747, which now is 35 years, uh, with the loss of all 259 passengers uh, and crew on board, 11 on the ground, the question of who was responsible has never been fully and satisfactorily resolved. I followed the Lockerbie case since the time of the bombing when I was working for the Jerusalem Post as its London correspondent, and when I happened to see material in the early stages of the investigation that pointed not to Colonel Gaddafi's Libya, but rather to Iran and the Palestinian terrorist organization PFLPGC, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command, earlier in 1988, the U.S. Navy's guided missile cruiser USS Vincennes had shot down an Iran air Airbus in the Persian Gulf, killing all 290 passengers and crew in a tragic case of mistaken identity. The U.S. said it had misidentified the civilian airliner as a fighter jet. Iran had promised to avenge the deaths. Ayatollah Khomeini had vowed that the skies would, quote, rain blood, end quote. The PFLP GC was believed to have been paid $10 million to carry out the Lockerbie bombing. It certainly had the bomb-making expertise, having become notorious in the 1970s for a series of terror attacks on airplanes, uh, including what, uh, the, the event that you spoke of in Entebbe. They were, I believe, involved in that as well. Just weeks before the Lockerbie blast, four devices strikingly similar to the one that would soon be utilized to such devastating effect on Flight 103 had been found in the possession of PFLPGC members arrested in Frankfurt suburb. That PFLPGC cell was reported at the time to have been planning to blow up planes heading to the U.S. and Israel. Its bombs, like those uh, the PFLPGC had used in the past, and like the Lockerbie device, were detonated by a barometric pressure device and timer, activated when a plane reaches a certain altitude. A fifth bomb in the Frankfurt cell's possession was said to have disappeared. This was presumed to be the device that blew up Flight 103. Incredible. Well, the uh, circumstantial evidence really does point to the PFLP, but yep. also to the Iranian regime as well. So he also says that almost seven years ago, a colleague of mine at the Times of Israel uh, noticed that a man named Marwin um, Karset, a Jordanian national, uh, maintained an Arabic language Facebook page in which he had taken to posting pictures of the Lockerbie bombing. He says that Kassaset uh, was a PFLPGC bomb maker in chief, uh, the alleged maker of those biometric pressure devices. He was one of those who was arrested by the German authorities in Frankfurt, only to be uh, inextricably released soon afterwards. Now he was promising to reveal more truth about, uh, about Lockerbie to write about Pan Am Flight 103, including who was on the flight and the circumstances of the incident. Uh, over the years, I've had the opportunity to raise the question of the Lockerbie bombing with several former Israeli intelligence figures who were in office at the time of the bombing and well aware of the activities of the PFLP GC at the time. Two of them insisted without elaboration that Libya did it and brushed away further questions. A third, by contrast, told me it was clear that Jabril prepared the operation. 
And uh, this is interesting. He also says that Israel was listening on in the PFLPGC during the months prior to Lockerbie. Uh, he said, at, um, and hearing about preparations for what he thought was a plan to target an Israeli plane. He says there was a huge alert in the Israeli security establishment because of indications that the PFLP uh, GC was about to strike. Uh, the source went on. He says, we told the British and Americans what we knew, which was that there was an intention to hit an Israeli plane. We didn't warn about a British or an American plane because we didn't know that, he said. So clearly within the intelligence communities of Britain, the United States at the time, the Israelis were warning that there was plans to bring down what they thought was an Israeli passenger plane, not an American Pan Am Flight 103, because they didn't have the evidence for this. But it seems that clearly this was on the radar. So what was the role of the intelligence agencies to actually prevent such a horrific terrorist attack? And we've also got to remember as well that it's only because of these attacks occur that we know about plans. So we don't know about the plots. We don't know about the failed terrorist attacks, whether a hijacking of aircraft or the destruction of trains or blowing up of key significant buildings. We don't know um, until something has actually leaked to the press um, for grounds of raising awareness of what's happening, um, that this is actually in the public domain. But it seems to be many of those who worked from the CIA together with the Israelis who worked, um, worked in security related issues, did warn that the Iranians were planning this with the PFLP and there might be an Iranian connection. But what we can see, think the evidence is Iran was not involved. But this actually follows in with uh, US foreign policy. If we look about what happened uh, during the Reagan administration now, uh, your namesake, President mm. Reagan, I think, has to go down as one of the most successful American presidents, certainly in the post-war era. Uh, certainly my favorite president for the way that he confronted the, uh, the Soviet threat during the Cold War. Um, but he turned a blind eye to acts of terrorism by the Iranian regime. And uh, we can see this, he did this with the uh, US Marines um, bombing and US bar uh, barracks bombing in Lebanon. I think it killed over 270 US Marines in, in Lebanon in 1982. Then we were, they also, Hezbollah then also blew up the uh, American embassy mm. and French embassies. And they also then kidnapped William Buckley, who was the CIA station chief for, um, in Beirut mm -hmm. and murdered him. And then we also see that the uh, likes of Terry Waite and, other, and John McCarthy, other Western hostages, British and Irish, were arrested um, and then kidnapped by the Iranian regime. And we see really that America did nothing regarding that and knowing this is all coming from the, the Iranians and also with the 9-11 commission also indicated that there was Iranian involvement in 9-11. So you can, you can ask with the foresight of history mm. that had the evidence been given to President Reagan, his administration, it would then going into 1980. So this would have been George W. Bush would have been sworn in as president uh, in January of, of, of uh, 1989. Um, then George H.W. Bush. George H., yeah. yeah, his father. So then what we would have seen then is that the Iranians would have been the culprit and the Americans would have taken action against the Iranian regime and maybe 9-11 wouldn't have happened. Yeah, you see the thread of history and tragically, while you would like to think that there can be peacemakers and that's a great idea, you know, appeasement has never worked and it's led in this situation to the loss of countless thousands. It still does today. There's chilling overtones here in regards to and the PFLP, GC, and some of the tactics of various Palestinian terror groups to this day. Um, this Jabril individual had broken away from the National Liberation of Palestine in the early 60s because of the revolutionary language of the PFLP and um, the, the, the big selling point for him was the destruction of Israel. Their whole goal, and the, this is the Guardian in 2001 saying, Israel must be destroyed by military action where necessary against civilian targets. That was the, this uh, radical Palestinian terror group's um, primary purpose. His small group of several hundreds um, believed that they could, uh, well, they achieved their notoriety initially by sending in suicide squads dangling from motorized hand gliders. That sounds somewhat familiar. chilling and familiar, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, we know that uh, 
the Islamists had taken over in the time of, um, you know, well, in the early 90s, you know, Hamas was only small. So it only wasn't until Itzhak Rabin uh, decided to kick all the Hamas uh, out, I think t over 200 of them, and place them in southern Lebanon. Um, and when they were in southern Lebanon, they got trained by Hezbollah. Mm. And this is where the Iranian connection came in with Hezbollah and Hamas and still lasts today. But, I mean, we see that many changes have happened since the Lockerbie bombing, um, that there's tighter security at airports. Uh, you know, there are now... Uh, um, radars, uh, x-ray machines that mm. scan your luggage before you can go through, proper body checks. Um, so some of the lessons have been learned, but the ultimate lesson hasn't been learned, and that's the need to confront the Iranian regime. We're moving very swiftly on toward uh, that escalation, I do believe, and um, yet we've waited to the point of time when Iran is almost nuclear capable. So there we are. Simon, uh, it's been great to have this program with you. Um, um, thank you very much, and thank you to our viewers for tuning in this evening. Yep, so also thank you, Reagan, as well. So I want to thank you very much at home. Uh, what we can see as we actually remember the 35th anniversary of the Lockerbie bombing is that we need that hunger for truth and follow truth to where it takes us. And I think this comes to the Iranian regime's involvement in Lockerbie. So thank you for watching this week's edition of Behind the Headlines. <laughs>